once upon a time when words were like magic, there was a woman and a man, and they lived in the wild tangle of a spruce and cedar forest. They had known each other for a long time. Many seasons had weathered their faces. And uh, we'll say they knew each other well. Some things never change, and many things do. Um, they both knew the language of the forest in a way that has been long forgotten. When they dreamt at night, they dreamed the earth. And the earth dreamed them. Now, the woman had made peace with her man long ago. She had accepted that he was not the handsomest man. She had made peace with the sharp words that flew from his mouth sometimes. Over the years, what had started as a small little pebble had grown into quite a boulder of discontent. And the one thing that really troubled her, the one thing that she had no patience for, that caused her great pain, was her husband's secretiveness. Oh, he was secretive. He wouldn't tell her everything, and she wanted to know. She told him everything. In fact, she probably told him too much. Hmm. Some things do not change. So one day, she thought, I will follow him. I will follow him into the forest where he goes every day. And he hunts, and he brings home what he gathers, just as I go hunt and gather. But I will follow him and see. And the difference is that when I go out, I tell him. I tell him about the scent of the birch, and the song I heard the wind singing. When he goes out, I hear nothing. I hear nothing. So she decided to follow him. Indeed, she would follow him. In fact, the next morning. And so that night, she did not change out into her bed clothing. She stayed fully dressed. The sad part is her husband would not even notice. Such was the time they had known each other. She did not sleep well, and she listened. He slept very well and woke as he did every morning, making sounds and noises and clearing of the throat and uh, others. And... Um, he lifted off the blankets. He put both feet on the floor. He pulled on his boots, his boots which were bespoken, made from hides and furs that he had hunted and gathered and sewn, like hers. And when he slipped out the door, then she pulled the skins off of her, the sleeping skins, and crept out of the house. Now, it was not yet light, but it was not quite still dark. And she knew the language of the forest. She knew how to trail and track and move through the forest as quiet as a panther. And so she watched her husband as he walked away from the hut stomping away in the morning. And she noticed after some time that his, his gait became a little lighter and he almost bounced as he walked. He never did this in the hut. 
And after some time, she saw how he, his gait was light and he began to whistle. He began to whistle a tune, quite an uplifting tune, like one of the sweet birds of praise singing. He never whistled such a tune in the hut. Hmm. But she followed him, and to her knowledge, he did not know she was there. And eventually he came to a meadow, wide, and a constellation of flowers were just waking, dew-lined, ready for the day, as they are. And she watched him walk through, touching the yarrow tops and the buttercups and the milkweed and making his way towards a magnificent old, old oak whose branches reached out and up, whose roots she knew went deep and wide. And he faced east and the sun was just making its descent, or sorry, its rising from the lip of the horizon through the branches of the tree. Now the leaves had not yet come into their fullness, so there was more transparency in the forest. And she watched as he got down on his knees. He brought his forehead to the earth. And as if all the creatures of the meadow and the forest stopped just to listen. And then he began to sing. He sang as he stood up. He sang to the sun words of praise, words of welcome. They say if you can name 13 words of praise to something most beloved, that relationship will be eternal. And so he sang, he sang to the sun. She had never heard him sing. And for, for a moment she watched as he sang, the lines on his face softened, and he actually looked quite handsome. Hmm, her husband, her man, she could feel her heart warm and widen and flood. Hmm. And she just leaned up against the tree far out from his sight and she listened. And she listened until the sun had risen just a little higher in the sky. This was her man. He sang to the sun, and this was his secret. Hmm. She looked behind and she saw just the faintest cusp of the moon still there in that morning sky, descending. And she actually felt another layer of love for this man that she knew so well, too well. <laughs> and in a moment later, she knew what she must do. <laughs> she picked a yarrow head and tucked it in her bag. She blew words, 13 names of praise, into her cupped and capable hands. And then she blew that towards her man. And then not looking back, she turned around and left. And she ran. She ran, her feet moving over moss and stone and branch. 
She ran. She ran far. And in that moment, she felt a sense of exhilaration and freedom that she had never known. From the cradle, her parents' yurt, her husband's hut, and now, free. So for some time, a timeless time, she ran for a day, an hour, a week, full of that sense of freedom. Now, living in this forest, and perhaps her freedom blinded her to what lurked in that forest. Not just the creatures, but other more than human beasts dwelled there, and they still do, but we have lost our listening. So she was not aware of the giant hiding behind a wide and broad beech tree. But the giant had been watching her. He had smelled her from a long way off. He had smelled that freedom. This would taste good in his belly. He knew it. And so he waited. He waited until she came flying, bounding through the forest. Her hair had caught little branches and spider's webs, and they trailed from her hair as she ran. And she did not see it coming when he literally grabbed her around the neck as she passed and threw her into a sack. Talk about abrupt. Talk about shocking. One minute she was flying, free, and the next caught, trapped someone's supper. (laughs) The giant grabbed her and she fought and fought, but how could you get out to the canvas zone? Well, and the next thing she knew, she was dumped into a dark yurt. The floor was dirt. She smelled the earth. It had been covered for a long time was dead. There was no life in it. So she was catching her breath, gathering her wits, trying to make sense of what had happened to her. Once she'd been caught and in the sack, she knew she smelled him then. Giant. She knew they were around. Not all of them had gone to sleep as they do And as they have, many are still sleeping. The soft mounds of hillocks and moorlands are sleeping giants, they say. But this one had not slept. And she had been caught. And now she was sitting on dead earth in the dark. Hmm. Well... She was too old to weep, she thought. And she was too young to sing for what was. So she sat there on her knees, reconciling her fate and the twist of fate and the tricks of the gods. And her eyes began to become accustomed to the dark, as they do, you know. Our eyes become accustomed to the dark so we can see more. And she noticed on the ceiling of this little structure made of skins, There were animals and birds. She recognized the gleaming 
translucent emerald black of raven's wings. She saw a badger's mask up there. They were not li- they were not alive. They were up there. They had been trapped or caught or pierced with an arrow. Hmm. She saw a raccoon. She saw some ducks. Oh, and at the far end of the yurt, she saw Swan. Swan was big, big magic. It was a dark deed to hunt Swan. And then she heard inside through now that the, the chaos and the upheaval and the everything that had transpired in a relatively short period of time, the love for her husband, the seeing of him, and the leaving of him. Her capture by an awake and hungry giant. And she knew what would happen to her this evening. She would feel the lick of the flames at her feet. (laughs) And she could feel peace. She could feel peace. And somewhere in that, a little rising shoot, the still, small, quiet voice inside said, Raven, Raven, She looked up at Raven. There Raven was. She could see the twinkle in its eye with no sight left. Raven. She'd always been drawn to Raven. Raven will take away what is dead and turn it into food. So the little sprouting thought, Raven. So she reached up, uncramping her knees, and reached high and pulled Raven down. And the urge was to wrap herself in Raven, or wrap Raven in her. And so she did. She pressed her hands along the wings, and stepped into the delicate weaving of her feathery body, but it was too tight, it was too confining, and she knew this raven was not the choice. So what then? She set raven down. She listened. Sometimes it's all we can do is listen. What a gift to just listen. She heard the pounding of her heart. Hmm. That drum. And she heard the sesh of her breath ebbing and flowing. And then she looked up again and she caught the gleam, this burnished coppery glow of fox's tail. Fox. She thought, well, the still, small, quiet voice had said raven, but maybe there's a deeper voice. Maybe, maybe fox. So she she reached up and she pulled fox down, burying her hands in the soft, musky fur of fox, pulled fox down. Oh, she did like the weight of feeling fox in her hands. Beautiful fox. And so she tried and she moved her arm in and her other arm through and she brought the head of fox up to crown her own. Fox felt good. 
She stepped into the hind flanks. The box felt right. Mm. And the minute she did that, it's as if fox trickled into her and her sense of smell became very keen. She smelled the dead earth that she had smelled when she came in. She smelled still the lingering scent of the animals overhead. She smelled the skin of the yurt. But she also smelled pine. She smelled the forest, which she knew was just outside and all around her. But this was a direct line of pine. And she sniffed around the edges of the yurt, pressing her nose down next to the edges of the yurt. And with claws, fox claws, she began to dig. Raven could not dig. Raven could fly. Sometimes you must dig deeper. And so she began to dig and dig and dig and dig right under the lip of the yurt and out. And like liquid silk, she crawled under that skin and out into the woods. that freedom returned and she began to run. So she ran and she ran, but she didn't know where. She knew not back to her husband's hut. The only other place she had known was her parents. Maybe she could go there and rest and eat well for a day or two and see. So she turned her way back towards her home place where she had been born. And it took her a number of days to reach this place. And by the time she arrived, she was tired, hungry, and thirsty. And she saw the village across the lake. And the lake was inviting, as always, a lake, this water that was her first water. She knew this lake. And she bent down to drink. And that's when she saw her reflection. She did not see the dark hair that she had known all of her life when she gazed into a still pool. She did not see the dark eyes. She saw fox. And of course she had known, but sometimes seeing is believing. (laughs) So after she had had enough fresh water, she sat back and she thought, now food, how will my parents recognize me? And as if on cue, she saw her father walking from the village. Now, what she didn't know is that her father was going out from the village that day to go hunt fox. You see, the fox that had been coming around and stealing the dried fish, and those creatures could not steal. They're tricky. So he was going to go trap and catch fox. But she didn't know this. She just saw her father, her father. He would recognize her. I'm still his daughter. And so she moved through the grass and stepped out into the light where now he could see her. And he thought, there's one of those foxes. And he began to move towards her. And she began to move towards him. And she gave him that look, the look, well, he'll just recognize me because of the look that I'm giving him. But he did not recognize. He had a piece of salmon in his hand that he would use as bait. And he saw the fox and he tore off a piece of this fish and tossed it to her. Oh, she was on it, pouncing and gobbling it up. Oh, yes, more of this, please. But he did not recognize her. 
but the smell and the taste of food now took precedence. And so she got closer and closer, and he tried to bait her, and he had his net ready. And father and daughter did this dance back and forth and all of their ancestors standing behind them watched as they went back and forth. She was quick, and eventually her father gave up. Bah! He could see that she was hungry, so he threw her the fish, and he said, enough, beaten by a fox. It's not the first time. It won't be the last. And so he turned his back on her, she gobbled the fish, and she sat in the sun. If I go back to the village, maybe they'll recognize me. And so she did. Now, she went back and she found the yurt of her birth. But for some reason, she was barred entry. It's a strange thing. Every time she tried to nose her way in through the door, it's as if the door moved. And she just bumped right in to the frame. This went on until her nose was bloody, until her head was sore. But there's only so many times you can bump your head up against that door frame. <laughs> so this was not where she needed to be. She was exiled, but that was all right. <sighs> so she took her sore nose and her sore head and she slinked out of the village, but not before getting a good mouthful of fish as it dried. And then she heard something that Still, small, quiet voice wasn't so small anymore. It had had the space and freedom to grow a bigger flame now. And she knew. And she ran and she ran. And she ran higher out of the forest, up into the foothills. And higher she ran and ran until she started climbing up the mountainside. And as she climbed, many days passed, many years perhaps, we're not sure. But what we know is that the sun had set and the moon rose. And as she ran, you would have seen sparks fly off her paws, landing on stone, shocking stars right up and out into the sky until the whole dome of that deep indigo night was salted with stars from her paws. And when she reached the very preface, the very top, she just lifted up and launched her burnished body like a comet into the night. Some night, when you're still and your eyes aren't afraid of the dark, you can look up and you will see her. You will see. And it might 